Hold on on tight tight for the the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into a place, a zone zone called called the alternative to the alternative media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, Greg Anthony here, and glad you're back on the Investigative Journal on this February 28th, 2017 day on our calendar. Before I get to my second show on Fatula Gulen and the Gulen movement and how uh, this man through charter schools that we finance here in America is uh, posing as a moderate Islamic uh, cleric who's really preaching uh, and his whole worldwide organization is radical Islam and the takeover of Western civilization. Uh, Let me give you the Jesuit quote of the day. And uh, this is by Hector McPherson. He wrote a book called The Jesuits in History. And he said this, quote, They, the Jesuits, have so constantly mixed themselves up in court and state intrigues that they must, in justice, be reproached with striving after world dominion. They cost kings their lives, not on the scaffold, but by assassination. And equally hurtful as the Society of the Illuminati, they were the foremost among the crowd at all events, who applauded the murder scenes in Paris, during the French Revolution. And that was Hector McPherson in his book, The Jesuits in History. And the important thing you have to understand is that they are, this organization, the Jesuits, are involved right now in the, uh, uh, first, the creation of ISIS, along with the CIA and other Western assets that are really trying to bring this country down from within, a story you do not get anywhere on the mainstream. And that's why people come here to what I call the alternative to the alternative news, because many in the alternative don't don't even go down this road. Uh, <clears throat> so let me do, uh, yesterday I talked about Gulen. Let's continue on that. Okay, yesterday I talked uh, in general about his movement over the uh, course of, uh, since the 70s, and I got familiar with him about 10 years ago, maybe even a little more, when he was uh, in Norway and Sweden, posing as a moderate again and basically infiltrating these countries uh, with Islamic terrorism and uh, radical Islam. Now, I talked yesterday how the Clintons brought him over in the 90s and how he has set up shop here in the Pocono Mountains. And we're funding him anywhere from $250 million to $500 million a year taxpayer money regarding his charter school system. And I asked the question, what's he really teaching? Today we're going to go look behind the scenes and quote him. I found a presentation that's uh, really done pretty well, and they present it in, uh, in Turkish and other foreign languages. So I will provide you with their translated copy of that. And we're going to listen to a lot of members from his organization worldwide and also from Gulen, and by that you'll get an understanding of what he's doing here. And the question I always asked is, why would our government bring this man here unless they were really working partial, you know, parts of our government to overthrow uh, the United States as we know it, and to actually bring in Islam and create this war on terror? I say it's just another Jesuit way of... Uh, take over of a country when you allow them to be so influential in our com- in our country as they are. Uh, you have nobody at the top that's doing us any good. They're playing a game with us. And this is why when the coup in Turkey took place, it was so important. We've gotten the other side. Of, oh, we've got the, side, the Jesuit side of the story. Erdogan, the president there, was the bad guy. When in fact, Gulen Uh, had to be taken out of Turkey by our CIA. First of all, he's a CIA asset. When the leaders of Turkey realized he was infiltrating uh, their government to overthrow it, just like they destabilized Syria and Libya and, and the rest of the Middle East. They were doing the same thing. And so when this coup took place and uh, Erdogan, the president, was notified prior, just prior his life, he, he was 15 minutes away from being uh uh, from the coup working, you know, and actually uh, getting him out of office. But he was tipped off by Putin. And then when he realized, uh, you know, what had happened, 
he started cleaning house there because Gul, the Gulen movement had festered and into that country to overthrow the Turkish government. And uh, he actually said to the United States, uh, "We, I want this man back, but he's still sitting in the Pocono Mountains. Obama dropped the ball, probably working together with him. Now what's Trump going to do? Because this man is creating an organization here from within, an educational organization from within to destroy Western civilization. And that's a pretty bold statement, but I think this next presentation backs it up by members of his group, his uh, worldwide organization that's estimated to be over $25 billion. He's in many, many different countries. And uh, <clears throat> he's right here, right now. And so we've got to talk about why hasn't our government gotten rid of him? Why don't we hear anything on the mainstream about this? All these big uh, talk shows uh, and all these big guys on Fox, the, le the right wing uh, <clears throat> station and CNN, the left, they talk nothing about this guy. You'll hear a snippet here and there. But the truth never gets out. So go to my show yesterday and then put it together with today's show. And I think you'll get a good idea of what I'm saying here. So this following presentation is meant to shed light on a secretive shadowy uh, cult. And that's Gulen's cult. And uh, he's headed by this man called Fatula Gulen, G-U-L-E-N. And uh, everything here that you're going to hear is, is, is said by Gulen and himself or by former members of this cult. Now, when you look at his organization, it reminds me of how the Jesuits are set up. And these members uh, dedicated decades, the ones that are presented in this presentation, which I'm going to translate, uh, they, they've spent decades into the service of Gulen before realizes, realizing his ultimate goal. That's world dominion and at any cost. And they say, let this be a warning to those who have yet to see the dark side of him. Gulen will not stop at anything before realizing his goals, and he will use forms of terrorism to achieve them. He tried to take over Turkey. Could your country be next? Fatula Gulen, like I said, is currently living in the Pocono Mountains, freely in the United States. Here's what he said. Because these fools, this is Gulen, do not understand us. They claim they do. Are these guys insane? claiming I would strive for such small things as overthrow of a government. I'm a man who decided to overthrow, uh, decided to overthrow that government and establish a new one. Instead, one instead, when I was 20 years old, I was thinking of that. But that's not really my main goal. And here he keeps talking. <laughs> and here he goes. Condescend, I would need to degrade myself. I would need to descend a thousand steps for that. And, he continues, you are fools. And in this statement that's taken by Gulen, what he's saying is he was, he was confronted with overthrowing Turkey. And he said, no, I'm not only doing that, I'm doing much, much more. Now, what they're saying in this presentation is that this terror cult leader, Fatula Gulen, who is being backed by the CIA and living in the Pocono Mountains, threatens, threatened Turkey with destruction. And he started years and years ago. Now, his headquarters, his Gulenist headquarters, are in what's called in Sailorsburg, that's S-A-Y-L-O-R-S-B-U-R-G, Pennsylvania, United States of America. And I'm looking at this compound. It's huge. It's a huge mansion up there. And I'm sure it's all backed by CIA and your taxpayer dollars to spread radical Islam. Now, here's a few quotes by him. May God rain fire upon their houses. And he's talking about Western civilization. And talking about anybody who opposes radical, may they destroy their homes. Anybody who talks, may they destroy their unity. He's talking right now. May their hopes never see the light of day. He's talking about Western civilization and anybody who opposes radical Islam. May God block their way. May God destroy their future. And it goes on and on. And this man, we support, oh God, defeat them, please. We, we allow him here? How come we don't hear this? And make them quake. 
he's saying is I'm watching destruction before my eyes and and uh, civil unrest and break their unity and we support this and split their congregations how come you don't hear this on the mainstream news and break them into a thousand pieces this is Gulen speaking and he's talking about what he'd like to see done in Turkey and inflict them with evil against one another and I'm watching scenes of rioting and chaos Gulen and his members of his cult hidden within the Turkish military were not able to scare the Turkish people in his submission the people rose up and united behind democracy and their elected government and then guess what we try to go over and create a coup to get rid of Erdogan while uh, he's here Fethullah Gulen attended and this is one of a uh, little bit of history he was he attended school but was forced to drop out of second grade now, Latif Erdogan, one of his top lieutenants of the Gulen cult, said this about him. He left after 40 years. In 1967, 68, 69, he set up camps. In those camps, he works to build his following. Now, Latif Erdogan was with him for 45 years. Following this effort, as of 1971, he, was, he has formed his cult. This started back in the 70s. I met Fatula Gulen in 1968 and I finished elementary school and attended the middle school where he was the principal. I spent the next 45 years at his side. Now, Hussein Gulersi was the president of Gulen's newspaper, Zaman. Zaman worked as a mouthpiece for the Gulen cult and was closely controlled by Gulen personally and his lieutenants. Gulersi spent nearly 25 years working as a columnist at first and later as a president of the paper Zaman. And here's what he had to say about Gulen. <clears throat> Not pretty. So we're getting an inside look. Starting from middle school, the cult chooses the best and brightest students. They stay in houses of light that are run by a big brother. He's talking about how they set this up. These big brothers are college students. They are also very bright themselves. They attend uh, <clears throat> Turkey's top universities. He's talking how they, they <clears throat> start the, the children who attend are first taught how to be t respectful towards their parents. This is so when parents inquire, the students tell them about them and say it's good. This makes the family important. But the very next thing they're given, they're taught in that Fatula Gulen is very important and introduce many things that make you exalt Fatula Gulen. For example, they tell the kids that if they don't wake up for nightly prayers, the religious leader Gulen is watching you makes a note about it and during his weekly Thursday meetings with the Prophet Muhammad <clears throat> during, uh, he will take uh, he will scold you in this way these kids are fooled into believing uh, that Gulen is the supreme being so to speak uh, <clears throat> I call this they put them under hypnosis because the hypnosis begins during the high school years when military officers are in military high schools, even these kids become generals in the military. They believe that Fatula Gulen is the chosen savior, the awaited Messiah. Wow. So what's going on in these charter schools here in America? Probably the same thing, right? But we don't hear anything about it, do we? I didn't even hear anything about it from Betsy DeVos. They just did an educational, huge uh, uh, hearings on, uh, you know, Betsy DeVos to be approved as the educational secretary of our country. But did we hear anything about this? A huge charter school movement? She's supposedly for charter schools and wants to give Americans more choice. I hope it's not this choice. So we go on, and he's talking about Gulen. And so they disregard any orders that are given to them by their commanding officers and only heed the orders of the chosen leader, the Imam of the universe, Fatula Gulen. Now, isn't that interesting? It sounds like the way the Jesuits are set up because the Jesuits basically obey the Jesuit general. 
So in the Gula movement, he says, it's incorrect to question why don't they follow anybody else. What Won't the assistant to the top, uh, they want them to follow Gulen as well. Because it's like a chip that has been implanted into the brains when they are in high school. So they are being brainwashed. Fatula Gulen commands them in Pennsylvania from his cult headquarters, and they execute out his commands. He's Gulen's commanding his commanders, just like they do here. The Jesuit general giving his orders all over the world to the Jesuit uh, consulates all over the world. They've divided our country into ten quadrants. Similar stuff going on, huh? So here we have this cult group. They, the cult, takes these kids from a very young age by recruiting them at schools, dorms. And this is Erdogan Latif, one of his uh, leaders talking again. And they take them wherever they're able to find them at university, exam prep courses, etc. And are educated by the cult's guidance, counselors or teachers. And are chosen, you know, uh, and are educated by those that hold promise are smart and intelligent the one the smart ones now there he's saying are given special treatment picked up and are dealt with individually so they're looking for the best and brightest when the individual interactions begin the first step is for uh, the guidance counselor teacher to build a very very a strong relationship and rapport with this child gain his trust during his trust building phase the students end up trusting their teacher completely and accept them as the father or mother and not according to their direction given by their teacher first in choosing which schools to attend so the teacher is now taking over or what to study or major in and later in indoctrinating them into the greatness of Fatula Gulen so the instructor takes over as the parents the saint and ultimately ends with Gulen so they're basically uh, turning into this great and unattainable idol in their mind, Fatula Gulen. Later, any orders or commands given to these kids as they grow up are uh, basically said to be orders directly from Gulen. So now we got Gulen controlling everything, correct? Yes. Okay, let's continue. Now, Gulen's at the top, right? He's teaching everybody to exalt him as the imam the great imam of the world the true messiah if these kids are channeled into the military now they have military schools they are treated with great care very great care he says and importance and are a distance from their parents their mothers their siblings they are specifically indoctrinated into ignoring their family wishes especially if they are enrolled in the military high school they are completely cut off from their families. Now that sounds to me like basically what they do in these cloistered nunneries and other places in the in the Catholic world where the parents become basically uh, not important anymore and are cut off completely from them so they can be brainwashed. And he says this process begins with cell homes at the lower level. Uh, <clears throat> These homes house students that number from six to seven, and most of these houses are headed by, uh, he's saying, a house brother or imam. The term imam is used all the time. Later, there's another level for the person that organizes three or five houses now. Another level for those that lead all of the houses in the neighborhood or district. And another level for the manager of all the houses in the city. Another level for the manager of three to five cities. And ultimately a level for the manager of all of Turkey. And this proceeds according to a hierarchical structure in all foreign countries, including those outside of Turkey. This, is, this system is being implemented as we speak. I was with this structure, he says, for 25 years. And nothing happens without Fatula Gulen's authorization. Quite interesting. So let me put this into perspective here. We're listening to a couple men who have worked with Gulen for over 45 years, trying to enlighten us about what he's doing here in the United States. So ask yourself, why? 
would our government, CIA, allow this to occur? Why would the Clintons bring them over unless they want to destroy Western education, Western civilization from within, creating a radical Islamic structure? And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, and remember what they said about Gulen. He will not stop at anything, and he's got support from all over the world now, of high places, from high people, including the United States, with CIA help. Okay, let's continue. Got about four minutes here before the break. So, nothing happens without Gulen. Only Fatula Gulen can appoint change the president of the newspaper. Remember we talked about the newspaper? He can only, only he can change the editor. Only he can change the uh, the district imams, all the people in charge. He is the uh, supreme messiah or ruler, they say. And only Fatula Gulen can do anything to change anything. As you know, they divided Turkey into seven regions. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? The Jesuits do the same thing. They divided our country into ten regions. And there was a point, I remember years ago, uh, I you can go and Google it. Just look up the ten different regions of the Jesuits. Each one has a head of that region, and it's set up similarly to the way the Gulen movement is set up. And they all report back to guess who? The Jesuit general at, at Santo Spirito Cinque in Rome. So we have the same type of organization working in, in Gulen under Islam, and the way the Jesuits are set up. Now, you don't hear this, folks. You've heard yesterday we talked a lot about the Clinton connections, the connections to the CIA and Gulen and why they're allowing him here. Uh, we also talked much about how the failed coup and how that exposed everything. But the media here quickly covered it up. And anything you hear in the mainstream is that Erdogan, the president's the bad guy, and Gulen is here protecting, you know, being protected against Erdogan when it's completely the other way around. And if they're just protecting this guy, why are they allowing his charter schools to function and finance them? And why are they allowing him to deal in heroin and all of the other things we talked about yesterday that Sybil Edmonds and others uncovered about this man? Uh, I think it's for what we talked about, world domination. And that brings a link directly to the Clintons, that side, the liberal side of our government, and the CIA, and explains why we destabilized the Middle East in order to create ISIS. And then I went farther and showed you the connection between uh, Father Thomas Michel, a uh, Father Daloglio, who's actually in Syria, Jesuit priests who are sympathetic to radical Islam and their connections to Gulen. And then we talked about even when Gulen met with the Pope. He met with Pope John Paul II and others. And so we have a strong, strong connection here that never gets reported. And the whole idea of open borders supported by Pope Francis, look what's going on in these countries over in, in Europe. Their first goal is to destabilize Europe and turn it around and control it from within, using radical Islam as their tool. Their next step is here, because they realize they cannot have a one world order, a one world control, a globalist control, without destroying the fabric of the United States. And I think that you're seeing it play out right before your eyes. This huge divide between our people now. We have people on the Trumpian side, the right, who are striving for nationalism and to keep America the way it once was. And then we have all of these other people. I mean, a huge um, amount of left-wing people who seemingly support things like this. Wow, we'll be back in uh, three minutes on The Investigative Journal. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment rights media channel. 
you will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. The following, the following program, program is labeled dangerous, dangerous and off limits by the supreme, by the supreme Jesuit, Jesuit command. command. But stand tall, people. people. Listen, Listen up, 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 and you, you may, may just, just learn, learn something. something. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, this ain't happening, man. This can't be happening, man. This ain't happening. Okay, we're back for the second half hour. And I think you got the point in the first half hour regarding what's going on in the charter schools of Fatula Gulen in our country and worldwide. We'll get back to some more comments from people who have left his cult and talk about it, as well as more comments from Gulen. But let me uh, spend this half hour. So, yeah, we'll do a couple more shows. In fact, probably tomorrow I'll continue on that. Uh, <clears throat> but let me, uh, let me digress a bit and show you how all of this uh, comes into play in the big picture, so to speak. And in the past, I referred to a book written by a Dr. Peter Hammond called Slavery, Terrorism, and Islam. And this book discusses how Islam progressively takes over countries. And we're going to uh, refer to an article written by Mark Ellis regarding that. And then I want to play for you, I found a, a video that explains who Dr. Peter Hammond is. And it's quite interesting. So why don't we do that right now? And then, of course, we'll get back to Gulen and more uh, talk about really what goes on at his schools on tomorrow's show. But in Ellis's article, he says that Dr. Peter Hammond's book, Slavery, Terrorism, and Islam, 
uh, documents the way Muslims slowly develop a presence in various countries, and as their population numbers build, become more aggressive and assertive about exercising Sharia law. Now, if we look at uh, what's happened in places in certain spots, even in Rome, I've talked about, and in, it, in Italy, we've talked about places in London, and then Sweden, Norway, France, Germany, were relatively small numbers of Muslims, but already enough where they set up, they don't assimilate into the country, they set up their own little neighborhoods. And in these neighborhoods, they exercise Sharia law. We see in London that they've estimated there's over 30 to 40 Sharia courts already functioning where they're exercising their law and disregarding the British law. So, and we see that in Sweden, no go zones there. We saw the recent uh, fire bombings there in Sweden on our TV stations here. So we have a huge problem, and the same thing's going on in Germany and France. But, <clears throat> quote Dr. Hammond, he says, Islam, folks, is not a religion, nor is it a cult. In its fullest form, it's a complete, total, 100% system of life. Dr. Hammond notes in his book, Islam has religious, legal, political, economic, social, and military components. The religious component is a, a beard is a cover for all the other components. Their takeover of a country, what Dr. Hammond refers to as Islamization, begins when the population of Muslims reaches a critical mass, and they begin to agitate for various privileges. Open, free, democratic societies are particularly vulnerable. When political, politically correct, he says, tolerant and culturally diverse societies agree to Muslim demands for their religious privileges, some of the other components tend to creep in as well. He notes this. He says this is how it works according to Dr. Hammond. And he says this, when the Muslim population remains under 2% in a country, they will be seen primarily as peace-loving minority and not as a threat to other citizens. This, folks, he says, is the current situation in the United States, Australia, Canada, China, Italy, Norway. And I might add in some of the, in the, in the bottom two countries, for sure those those numbers are have increased. And the United States, it's a, now look at what's happening here, how uh, Islam is being uh, presented to us here. And why those that say, watch out, like Dr. Hammond, are considered racist. But he says this, as the Muslim population reaches 2 to 5%, they begin to recruit from ethnic minorities and disaffected groups within prisons and street gangs. This is happening in... I believe it's happening here right now, but in Denmark, Germany, United Kingdom, Spain, Thailand, etc. And he says this, from 5% on, they exercise an inordinate influence in proportion to their percentage of the population. For example, notes Hammond, they will push for the introduction of halal, clean by Islamic standards, food and increase pressure on supermarket chains to feature such food on their shelves, along with threats for failure to comply. This is happening as we speak. In France, Muslim population they estimate at 8% or probably more now. The Philippines, 5%. Sweden, 5% or more now. Switzerland, Muslim, 4.3%. And the Netherlands, 5.5%. Oh, don't forget Trinidad and Tobago, 5.8%. Soon, they begin to apply pressure to allow Sharia law within their own communities. Sometimes the ghettos they move into or the, uh, or the uh, neighborhoods that are provided by social welfare services of countries like Sweden. Now, he says, when Muslims approach 10% of the population, they tend to increase lawlessness as a means of complaint about their conditions. Dr. Hammond notes, in Paris we are already seeing car bombings. Any non-Muslim action offends Islam and results in uprisings and threats. We're seeing that all over in Sweden as well, just recently. 
such as in Amsterdam with the opposition to Muhammad cartoons and films about Islam. These tensions are seen on a regular basis in places like Guyana, 10% Muslim, India, 13.4%, Israel, Muslims, 16%, Kenya, Muslims, 10%, Russia, Muslims, 15%. Violence increases when the Muslim population reaches 20%. And after reaching 20%, nations can expect hair-trigger rioting, jihad military formations, sporadic killings, and the burnings of Christian churches and Jewish synagogues, such as in Ethiopia, Muslim 32.8%. Now, did you recently uh, see, uh, see on our news the anti-Semitic uh, things that are going on where they were destroying a number of Jewish cemeteries recently? In our country now at 40 percent nations experience widespread massacres chronic terror attacks and ongoing mil militia warfare such as in Bosnia Muslim 40 percent Chad Muslim 53.1 percent Lebanon 59.7 percent but from 60 percent says dr. Hammond persecution of non-believing infidels rises significantly including sporadic ethnic cleansing, genocide, using use of Sharia law as a weapon, and jiza, a tax placed on infidels, such as in Albania, Muslim 70%, Malaysia, Muslim 60%, Qatar, Muslim 77.5%, Sudan, Muslim 70%. But after 80%, expect daily intimidation and violent jihad, some state-run ethnic cleansing, and even some genocide as these nations drive out infidels and move toward 100% Muslim society, which has been experienced to some degree in places like Bangladesh, 83% Muslim, Egypt, 90, Gaza, 98, Indonesia, 86, Iran, 98, Iraq, 97, Jordan, 92, Morocco, 98, Pakistan, 97, Palestine, 99, Syria, 99, Pakistan, 90, Turkey, 99.8, United Emirates, 96. But at 100%, he says, Muslim societies will theoretically usher in their version of peace. The peace of Daresh Salam, the Islamic house of peace. Here's their suppose, supposed con, uh, condition of peace because everybody is a Muslim. The madrasas are only school are the only schools, and the Quran is the only word, such as in places like Afghanistan, 100% Muslim, Saudi Arabia, 100% Muslim, Somalia, 100% Muslim, and Yemen, 100% Muslim. Dr. Hammam observes this, that this Islamic ideal is seldom realized. Unfortunately, peace is never achieved as in these 100% states, the most radical Muslims intimidate and spew hatred and satisfy their bloodlust by killing less radical Muslims for a variety of reasons. Quote, it is important to understand that in some countries with well under 100% Muslim populations, such as France, the minority Muslim population live in ghettos within which there are 100% Muslim and within which they live by Sharia law. Dr. Hammond is also concerned by the demographic trends. Quote, today's 1.5 billion Muslims make up 22% of the world's population, he observes, but their birth rates dwarf the birth rates of Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, and all other believers. Muslims will exceed 50% of the world population by the end of this century. So we better be very weary of what's going on in the world and who's behind it. And that's really why we do these shows. But I thought it'd be interesting. Uh, sometimes when you read articles like this, you wonder, well, who is this guy? Is some guy living in a think tank in Washington who's just putting together fig figures that have uh, that you have no idea you know he's a he's a nerd he's a think tank man and you th uh, he has never been out into the countries he talks about and he's talking basically as an academic you know somebody from academia who wants to get his point across but has no uh, personal uh, experiences or knowledge of the subject well dr. Hammond's quite different 
And I think you'll find this introduction to who he is. I'm going to uh, uh, present this short video about who Dr. Hammond is. And I think you'll find it quite interesting. Okay, and I think you'll find he's not a guy that just sits in a think tank in Washington. Here we go with uh, an introduction to Dr. Peter Hammond. Here we go. Dr. Peter Hammond is a missionary who has pioneered evangelistic outreach in Mozambique, Angola, and Sudan. Often riding his motorbike, Peter has traveled hundreds of thousands of miles to deliver Bibles to persecuted Christians in Africa and Eastern Europe. In the course of his missionary activities, Peter has been ambushed, come under aerial and artillery bombardment, has been shot, has been stabbed, has been beaten by a mob, has been arrested and imprisoned. On mission trips, he has flown behind enemy lines with tons of Bibles, booklets, and relief aid. <coughs> Peter has walked through the war-devastated Nuba Mountains, showing the Jesus film in Arabic, proclaiming the gospel, training pastors, and evading enemy patrols. Since 1990, Peter has received more than 1,800,000 scripture booklets from World Missionary Press. It is an honor for us tonight to welcome Dr. Peter Hammond. Good evening. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and of our Savior Jesus Christ. Since the very first time that Frontline Fellowship began 25 years ago, World Missionary Press has been an absolutely indispensable part of our work and our witness. World Missionary Press gospel booklets have been our spiritual ammunition in this war to win the souls of men and women as we have launched out into the war zones of Africa WMP gospel booklets have always been with us we've been called as a mission of ex-soldiers to work in war zones to evangelize soldiers to help persecute the churches those people who are suffering for their faith and we have been seeking to win Muslims to Christ and praise God for the spiritual ammunition that has come from New Paris, Indiana, from World Missionary Press, that we've been able to take out into the highways, into the byways, into the marketplaces. And by all kinds of transport, we've often gone in by aircraft. We've flown in way behind enemy lines into the Sudan in these DC-3s. And sometimes you get a bumpy landing. <laughs> but whether we're using aircraft or vehicles, four-wheel drive trucks on the freeways, and the interstates in Sudan, or crossing the bridges in Sudan, whether by foot or by boat, or by dugout canoe across into Angola. Often we've been down to bicycles because there's just no fuel, and much of the time we've been walking. And how grateful we are that World Missionary Press Gospel booklets are lightweight and compact. <laughs> And the people are hungry for them. The hunger for gospel literature is absolutely intense. We are surrounded. We have no trouble getting an audience when you've got great literature to distribute like that. When we are preparing our boxes with love for people suffering in Zimbabwe, World Missionary Press Gospel Booklets go in with that food, with that aid that goes to the starving and the suffering and the pensioners in Zimbabwe. Whether we are having soup kitchens out in the poorest areas, WMP gospel booklets go with, with the love and action, it's literature, love and action, and leadership training. Often we've used the Jesus form. Okay, so you get an idea. He's a missionary, and he's gone and traveled through all these countries, and has witnessed uh, what he's talked about in his book firsthand. Now, <clears throat> I'm not familiar with this, the uh, World Ministry or Market Press, but I am familiar with his book, and... It's well worth reading. Okay, I think I'll finish this uh, half hour with uh, a warning. And uh, this gentleman put together a presentation and tells us Sweden is headed towards a cliff. I've heard about Sweden in the news recently since Trump had mentioned at one of his speeches that something happened at Sweden last night. And uh, then they, you know, regarding a terrorist attack. And then they said, uh, the press got on him and said, nothing happened in Sweden. And basically what he said was he, he was referring to a documentary done by Ami Horowitz who talks about this influx of uh, migrants in Sweden that are creating a serious problem. So let's uh, 
play this little presentation regarding uh, what is Sweden headed for. This gentleman says towards a cliff. You don't have to be uh, Nostradamus to predict the future. You go to cities like Malmo, Sweden's third city, they have been, they are 20 years ahead demographically. That's what the rest of Sweden is going to be, and Sweden is taking more immigrants, uh, more refugees, than UK, France, and all the other Nordic countries combined. And at the same time, Sweden has, in the OECD, the largest gap in employment between natives and immigrants. It has a, it's literally the worst country in the, uh, in the world in terms of getting immigrants integrated into the labor market. The central problem of Sweden is that these facts are not openly discussed. The, the right, political right, the left, and the media, they have formed an iron cartel uh, to basically censor negative facts about immigration and sort of highlight positive spin on this issue. And, you know, for a Swedish um, academic or a politician or a reporter to, to go on TV and say the figures I've reported, that could destroy their career. And at, at any case, they would cause a, a huge amount of uh, social uh, re reprisal. People if, would... Before you continue, why? If, so it's, if, it's a fa if they're facts. This has, uh, this has uh, uh, deep historical reasons. And the historical reason, I would argue, is that when immigration, refugee immigration to Sweden started in the late 80s in large numbers, uh, there was a huge race, violent aggressive racist backlash. So, you know, this is another paradox about Scandinavia, that the Scandinavian countries are quite peaceful, but in terms of racist murders, they top the world. And the Swedish elite, again, the left, the right, and the media, they formed, you know, um, a counter movement to, 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 quell, um, to quell racism. And uh, if the politicians and the media can claim that immigration is good for economy, it's not causing unemployment, it's not causing social problems, then they easily win the debate, right? So then they cheat. Then they just uh, create this basically public lie that things are going great, we have minor problems, but it is basically beneficial. So the sort of a spin has become a reality to them. And given that they believe that, when they hear somebody say these negative pessimistic numbers, they assume it can't be true. Because if that were true, why, is it, why, why isn't everybody saying it on TV? You know, the social truth wins over the fact, factual truth. But, but, this, but, but I would understand this if there was a plan. So, okay, let's, let's lie for, uh, or white lies for a while until we solve this problem. The thing is, though, that the problem isn't solving itself. It's just slowly becoming bigger and bigger. And I have to say that the, the level of uh, speech oppression that you have, they have achieved you completely decentralized without any real laws or sort of, it's not Iran, they don't put you in prison if you say these numbers. What they do is they make a fired or you make, you know, half your friends are, are going to remove you on Facebook. It works. So uh, academics are off that, that, you know, these facts are well known by economists, for example, but economists are generally silent. What benefit is it for you if you're, a, if you look, if you're a blonde, blue-eyed Swede, to go and say, yeah, immigration is really bad for the economy. You know, but then, you're, then you are saying the same thing as those skinheads, right? So then maybe you're one of them, maybe you're, maybe you're racist. Why, why else would you say, be saying that? I mean, even the New York Times had an article where they were shocked about the so-called consensus in Sweden, how there was a sort of wet blanket over the debate. It's like an irrational immigration cult. Yes, it's, it's, it's uh, I, I would say... You know something, I think the same thing, if you think about it, is happening here. Let's get it's back to it. It's an anti-racist cult. That, that's what it is. So, you know, if you, want, if you want to sort of psychologize, Sweden is one of the most secular countries in the world, okay? They've lost their, their moral grounding because, the, and the elitists in particular, are aggressively anti-religion, right? So, but people, of course, need some sort of spirituality, morality, some values. And instead, the, the, their values are anti-racism. So they created this alternative reality for themselves, where it's the 1930s, and they're the guys fighting Hitler. And you know, if somebody says uh, immigrants have high, high unemployment, they, some of them genuinely think, yeah, that's exactly what Hitler said. They don't know what Hitler said. 
And I think you heard what he just said. It seems like that's what the left is doing here, fighting what they say Trump uh, is Hitler, right? Let's continue. So I don't understand that. And, and uh, that, to you, if you want, you can you can perhaps find an explanation in uh, in the lack of values, and people fill it up then with uh, with something else. It's a religious substitute. Yes, it's, 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 it, that's what it is. It's a uh, it's a quasi religion. Yes, it's a secular religion. So what is the future of all this? In the short run, they are just going to continue, and we have, we have the projections that the record levels that we have now are, are going to accelerate even further. In the long run, my guess is this is going to collapse. When you say collapse, what what comes to your mind? Economic collapse? In Sweden? Social unrest, yeah. Adam Smith said there is a lot of ruin in a nation. By, by that he meant that nations can take a, a lot of beating without collapsing. Sweden will never collapse, okay? What's going to happen if this continues is just the a gradual deterioration in social economic outcomes, more segregation. So what is the mentality? Is it NIMBY, not in my backyard, the, the leaders of Sweden, we're going to bring all these immigrants in because it makes us feel better, but they won't be going to our kids' schools. Yes. So among Swedish politicians, there was one of the Swedish newspapers, had a 1% of them leaving the, the areas where there are lots of immigrants. And those are typically immigrants. I mean that that just te- I, I, you know that tells you something about those people, right? The elite, which is this is a, a more multiculturalism for for voters, but not for me and my kids. If you really think multiculturalism is, is good, why don't you go live there? The fact that you don't live there, that almost none of them live there, not almost none of them send their kids to school there, shows that at a human level, at some level, they understand that it is not working. And, and these uh, these politicians, uh, some of them know. I mean, I talk to, you know, high-ranking politicians sometimes. Some of them know uh, what's going on and that it is uh, unsustainable and it's basically Sweden is slowly going to, toward the cliff. Okay, so there you heard it. A lot of similarities to what's going on here in the States. Will we listen or will we continue to go down this road leading to what he said would be Nothing more than a falling off a cliff. Back tomorrow on The Investigative Journal. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the truth about God's chosen people and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossTheBorder.org.